Maryam al Khwaja. You live in exile. You are a human rights defender. Why can't you live in Bahrain, fighting for human rights in your own country? After I started volunteering for the Bahrain Center, uh, after a while, we got messages from people we know that uh, there was a threat against me that I would get arrested. And I was forced to leave the country within 24 hours because of that threat. Um, and I went back in the beginning of February 2011. Um, I witnessed a lot of that ha what happened in the Pearl Square. I was there on the 17th of February when they attacked people while they were sleeping at 3 a.m. in the morning. And then in the beginning of March, I got an invitation to go speak at a side event at the Human Rights Council. And I remember I didn't want to leave. I, I thought that being in Bahrain and being in the protest was the most important thing that I could do. But my father, I remember, sat me down and he told me, in, in an uprising, in a struggle for human rights, you need to understand that people play different roles. And every role is just as important as the other because they complete each other. And yes, it's important for people to take part in the protest and to be inside the country. But we also need a voice outside. We need someone who can be outside and talk about what's going on. And if you don't go to speak at the Human Rights Council, then who will? And I left to testify at the Human Rights Council. Unfortunately, about two weeks later, the Saudi and the United Arab Emirates Army, under the pretext of the Gulf Cooperation Council military force, which is the Peninsula Shield, came into Bahrain. And that's when things took a very strong turn in the wrong direction. And I knew at that point that I couldn't go back. Going back meant going to prison and most likely being tortured. In January 2013, I decided to go back on a trip to Bahrain. And that was mainly because I wanted to see my father and my uncle in prison. Uh, since my father's severe torture uh, and imprisonment and life sentence, I hadn't seen him. And of course, he also went on a 110 day hunger strike, which almost cost him his life. So to me, it was very important to go back, see my family and especially see my father. So in August um, this uh, year, in 2013, again, I decided to go back. This time because there was a huge call for big protests on the 14th of August. And so I did. I booked my ticket, went to the airport in Copenhagen, and then I was told that I'm not allowed to board the plane uh, by British Airways. And when I asked why, they told me that there was an order from the Bahraini government uh, not allowing me to board the, the plane. And so I wasn't allowed to go. So. I was at once in exile by choice, it's no longer by choice. Your father is in prison, your sister is in prison. How is it living like this when your family, you can't stay together? In my head, they're not in prison. You know, they're my father and my sister, yes, and they're in Bahrain. But in my head, it's not a constant thought that they're in prison right now. Um, when I work on their cases, of course, I'm reminded. But most of the day, I'm not really thinking about it. And for us to do our work as human rights defenders, we need to normalize our situations. We need to do that to be able to do the work that is important to us. And for me, my father and my sister cases are important, but so are the cases of thousands of other Bahrainis who are in prison. And for those people, I need to stay strong and I need to be able to do the work that I do. What did they do that the Bahraini government didn't accept? The Bahraini ruling family wants complete economic and political control over the situation in Bahrain. Someone like my father is a threat to that control. And so they will do whatever is necessary to try and silence people like my father. And that is why today he is in prison with a life sentence, because he's a human rights defender. My sister Zainab, after my father was arrested, she became a lot more active in the protest movement. And there are many, many different images of her standing in front of riot police jeeps, trying to stop them from going into villages where they beat people and arrest people and shoot tear gas. Uh, there are pictures of her where she does one person protests, you know, in the middle of the street or in the middle of a roundabout where she gets dragged and beaten. She was shot in the leg with a tear gas canister that caused a serious injury to her leg. But even with her, uh, you know, the walking stick that she was given because of her injury, she still went and protested just a week later. And so, that kind of perseverance, that kind of dedication is also a threat to the Bahraini government. And that's why my father and my sister, like thousands of others who continue to protest, are in prison today. How is it to live in Bahrain today? When you're living in certain areas, when you're from a certain sect, because the Bahraini government, 
made the crackdown about going after people according to their sect, uh, which is the Shia sect. And so being a Shia in Bahrain means you're constantly under threat. You can have your house raided at any time. You can be arrested at any time. If you're stopped at a checkpoint, you're harassed. Um, and so it's living in a constant situation of when is it my turn? When are they coming for me? When will they break down my door in the middle of the night and come into my home? Uh, but despite that, people continue to go out to the, to the streets. And I always say, you know, it's not that people in Bahrain or any of these other countries are no longer afraid. Fear is the result of the consequences that they know exist. The consequences of torture, of killing, of beatings, of arrest, of harassment, of all these things. So that still exists because those consequences still exist. So the fear is still there. It's the fact that people have decided that there's something more important than their fear. That's what makes them continue. That's what makes them continue to go out on the streets and say, we will not give up. In Bahrain, there are many countries involved because of business. You have international companies involved. Oil. That's the headline, right? Oil. Um, what can they do to get into this, this fight for human rights? Or do they do anything? I like to call it the inconvenient revolution. Because Bahrain's struggle is not just inconvenient to the Gulf countries, which view this uprising as a threat not only to the Bahraini monarchy, but to all of the Gulf monarchies. They believe that if Bahrain, the Bahraini people are able to achieve human rights and democracy, then people in Saudi Arabia will want the same. That people in Qatar will want the same, and Kuwait, and the UAE, and all of the Gulf countries. And so they view this as a threat. So the Bahraini people are not just fighting one government, they're fighting six governments. Internationally speaking, and because of the Bahrain's geopolitical situation, we're looking at a situation where the relationship between Western countries, who say that democracy and human rights are the cornerstone of their foreign policy, their relationship with the Gulf countries, and especially Saudi Arabia, define how they respond to human rights violations in Bahrain. The fact that countries who say they respect human rights and democracy are willing to turn a blind eye and a deaf ear to massive ongoing human rights abuses every single day in Bahrain is a tragedy. These countries are the countries that are supposed to be upholding human rights. They're supposed to be upholding international accountability for governments that commit human rights abuses. But the, the reason the situation and the human rights situation in Bahrain continues to deteriorate today is because, first of all, we have an internal policy and culture of impunity, where officers and people who work for the government can get away with anything they do. But then also, on a second level, the Bahraini government believes, and they are correct in believing this, that they have international impunity, which means that despite all of the violations they've committed, they will not be held accountable internationally because of the security and, and uh, financial and economic relations that a lot of Western governments have with the Gulf countries. Today, a barrel of oil from Saudi Arabia is still more valuable than the, the blood of a Bahraini person. Do you have a demand or something you want to say to Norwegian companies, or Norwegian government? I think that the Norwegian government um, did a great thing when they started supporting the campaign for, for the protection of human rights defenders. I know this because when I was at the UN, at the Human Rights Council, I saw that it was Norway who was pushing for the protection of human rights defenders. They were pushing for a resolution to protect human rights defenders around the world. And so when Norway is pushing for the protection of human rights defenders, but is still willing to do business with a country that imprisons its human rights defenders, there we have a problem. So if human rights should be respected in your country, what should be done? As long as the government respects everyone equally, that is what is needed. It doesn't matter what political party is in power. It's the system that allows or limits what they can do with the citizens of that country. We need to set up a system in which even if you have a political party that you might not agree with in everything that they do, they should not be able within the system to violate anyone's rights. And I think that's the kind of system that we should strive for in Bahrain, a system that respects everyone. Since you are working outside Bahrain, how does your colleagues work inside Bahrain? The people that work on the ground in Bahrain, to the most part, the government doesn't know about. They don't know their names, and they, don't know, uh, they basically don't know who they are. And this is what keeps them safe. 
they know that there's a threat, not just to them, to their families, to their loved ones. Because the Bahraini government, when they target you, they don't target just you, they target everyone you love. Because they know that that's where it hurts. And so people who do this work have to have such conviction. They have to believe in it so much that they are willing to take the risks to do the work. And these are the kind of people that work with us on the ground. And that's why I call them heroes. It's hard to talk about violence, but we have to talk about the methods the authorities use. In Bahrain, what are the methods they use to people? You have extrajudicial killings, where people are killed uh, on the streets. Uh, usually they're shot, and the, the shots are fatal because of the way that they indiscriminately use excessive force against protesters. Um, and we've had dozens and dozens of deaths from uh, pellets. Uh, pellets is a kind of bullet that shatters into many, many different pieces, and it's metal pieces that go into a shrapnel, basically, and it goes into the skin. Now, if it's shot at a close distance, it can go into the organs, and that, that, will, cause, that will become fatal. Um, so we've had that, and it's usually actually used for hunting animals, but in Bahrain it's used against people. Uh, the second type is the tear gas canisters. Uh, tear gas has become a huge issue in Bahrain because the way that tear gas is used, it's weaponized. And there is not a single incident in the history of tear gas where it has been used the way it's being used in Bahrain. For the past two and a half years, the Bahraini government has used, I would say, millions of tear gas canisters where they go into areas. First of all, when you use tear gas canisters, they're supposed to be shot up in the air and not directly at protesters. And it's supposed to be used in open areas where people can get away from the smoke. And it's supposed to be used to disperse crowds. The way that it's used in Bahrain is that it's shot directly at protesters. We've had 14-year-old boys shot in the head and killed with tear gas canisters. Uh, and it's shot in areas, in residential areas, where there is no space for people to run and where it's closed in. So when the smoke comes in, it's suffocating and it can become fatal from suffocation. How is it for kids and teenagers to grow up in Bahrain today? Um, I think the generation that I worry about the most are the children, the children under 18. Because for us, you know, I'm 26 years old now and I grew up in an environment where violence isn't the only thing I know violence from the government forces. And so I can differentiate between what type of violence uh, or violence in general is wrong. And I can say that. And I can say that I support fully 100% nonviolence. But what I worry about is that these new generations that are growing up now, where they, the only thing they know from the government is violence, where they are being terrorized inside their own homes, where they are seeing their friends get shot and killed, what is going to be their reaction when they take to the streets? Maryam, do you sometimes think that this is so hard work, this is so much to do, and uh, this fight, I, I can't go on with it. Do you sometimes feel that you have to give up? Of course. I think everyone who does this kind of work reaches many times uh, or many points during their career where they think, I can't do this anymore. Um, I remember I thought that when I read my father's torture report in details, uh, that was, that's something I'll never forget. Um, that, another point was when I saw the video of my sister being beaten and dragged um, by police, you know, on YouTube. But I, I always remember something that my father told me, and that helps me to continue. He told me, when you're a human rights defender and you're fighting for human rights and justice, we don't do the work that we do because we believe that tomorrow things will change or in a year or a decade or even in our lifetime. We know that despite everything we're doing, despite dedicating our entire lives to this work, that we might not see change. Our children might not see this change. We do it because it's the right thing to do.